All right, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Mikhail, and today we're going to talk about RISC-5. Uh, as the title says, it's an introduction to RISC-5. So we'll see a little bit about it, its history, uh, a little bit about its truck instructions, instruction formats, about its extensions. Uh, extensions are a big part of RISC-5, <laughs> and uh, at the end we're going to see talk about uh, profiles. Uh, so first of all, who am I? Who is this random guy talking about? We are an open source consultancy. Uh, I'm from Manaus. This is a picture of our beautiful city. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science, uh, and I mainly worked during my academic years in with formal verification, uh, mostly focused in C++. So it's a way to verify a program without testing it and prove that the program is correct. Uh, today I'm working with RISC-5, uh, specifically porting the LLVM libc to RISC-5. I will talk a little bit about that at the end. And he is my contact, if anyone is interested, it's just mikhailatigalia.com. Okay, so let's start. What is RISC-5? So RISC-5 is uh, open instruction set architecture, uh, as known as ISA. You're gonna hear that when you see talk about instructions. Uh, it's not a chip like Intel, the Core i7, and it's not a piece of IP, uh, it's like the ARM Cortex Core, Core M. It's an ISA just like x86, ARM64, which we usually write as AARC64, or Core IPC. A uh, little bit of its history. Uh, it was started uh, in 2010 at Berkeley. Uh, RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. Uh, and it's five because it's the fifth iteration of its design. And in the next year, 2011, we had a first specification, basic, basic specification, and we already had a first type out in the same year. And in 2015, uh, the RISC-5 International was launched which is the global uh, foundation behind the, the RISC-5. And in 2023, this year, the foundation uh, released this, this market piece that tells us there are around 10 billion cores. These are not processors, right? So cores, so you can have more than one core per processor. So today we have 10 billion cores in the market. I have one here with me, uh, actually four. So there are four cores here. This is a Sci-5, Two board, uh, as you can see, is roughly the same size of uh, Raspberry Pi, has eight gigs of RAM, and it's a quite nice uh, board because it was mass produced through quick Kickstarter. So people were there and they crowdfunded and just mass produced this board. Uh, and a really nice history of the board. Um, uh, what makes this file so special? So first of all, it's free. Uh, so let's say you want to design an ARM IP. Uh, you have to pay a upfront license, which is around 10K to 10 million dollars. Um, you pay 1-2% uh, on the total uh, price of the chip. And there are rumors that they're going to change this license that you're going to have to pay based on the device price. So it's very expensive. They dominate the market, especially on mobile. So they are pushing the limit there. Let's say you want to design a x86 core like Intel or AMD. Forget about it. They are the the sole owners of Intel is the owner of the IP, if I if I remember correctly, and they have an agreement with AMD to produce it. Uh, on the other hand, with five is free, so you have uh, you are free to use it to extend and customize it in the way that you want. Um, it's open, it open, so it's designed on on a BSD license. Uh, RISC, the RISC-5 Foundation, RISC-5 International now, is the owner of, of the, the IP, the, the, the license, and they are licensed now under the Creative Commons license. Uh, after the RISC-5 Foundation, RISC Foundation was created, they moved to Switzerland like, to be more neutral, and they renamed to RISC-5 International, and in, in their, like, um, the founding documents they say that it doesn't have it doesn't have any intention of commercial use, 
Uh, they are non-perfect. They are only the governor body of, of the, the, the specification in the sense that they help design uh, discussions and to push forward the, the, the ISA. Uh, it's a singular universal ISA, so uh, it's designed to support both embedded device and high-end servers. It's designed to uh, all the, the micro-architecture styles, so you have in-order and out-of-order execution, you have single-use, super -scala. And is is designed to be extended for more specific use, so like AI specific graphics, etc. Uh, it's a fresh and a new ISA, and it's I think the the most important part is that it's simple, right? Um, it's modular. We're going to see that later, but it's really nice that we have a simple ISA. In comparison, let's see x86-64, so we have 3,600 instructions, and if you want to read the manual, it's 5,000 pages long, uh, so imagine the, the hardware design have to design everything, right? Uh, it's, it's really painful to do that. So ARM is supposed to be also a risk uh, reduced set of instructions, uh, architecture, and it has, its menu has 2,700 pages. It's massive as well. And we have stuff like this instruction. It's an assembly that loads multiple increment ad address on equal. So it has five loads. It writes to so six registers, registers. And only if equal is set. So that's a equal is set on the control register. Uh, and it writes to PC and performs a conditional branch. So imagine this might be very useful in some cases. I don't know where, but if you do all of that in a single instruction, you can do. And by the way, I'm going to talk about some assembly here. Uh, if you're not familiar with assembly, don't worry. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, in comparison, the RIS-532i, so RV32i specification, all fits in a single slide. So we have some integer, integer comp computation, so we have add and subtract, we have boot operations, sorry, uh, and or short operations for integers. Shift, we have load immediate, so when you hear immediate, you think constants, so we lo load constants, uh, we set flags, we have control, tra uh, control transfers, so mean branches, so think C or any other language, we have ifs. So that's a branch. Uh, we have jumps. So in an assembly code, we jump for another instruction, not right next, the next one, but you can jump for arbitrary pieces of the, the assembly. We have loads and stores, load from memory, store to memory. Uh, and we have some miscellaneous instructions, so fences for, for concurrency, for out of order execution, in order execution, and we have calls and breaks. Uh, so these are all the instructions you need to support to be compliant with the RV32i. Uh, registers, uh, we have 32 registers. I'm not going to go in detail through all of them. One nice thing was actually mentioned in the previous uh, talk. We have zero. So this is similar to ARM64. We have uh, x0, which is hardwired to zero. So you always have zero in that register. You cannot write to it. Everything that you write to this register is ignored. Uh, we have our usual stack pointer, global pointer, thread pointer, frame pointer. We have eight temporary registers, which is so nice. If you ever worked with 32 bit architecture like ARM or MIPS, then you only have four temporary registers. It's a pain uh, to try to make your code work with just four registers. Uh, it also has eight function argument registers. Uh, when you pass ar function, uh, arguments to functions. So, for instance, if you have MIPS, MIPS32 only have four registers. If you have a function with more than uh, more than four function arguments, they, you have to push into the stack. Uh, and it has 12 safety registers, four calling safe functions. Uh, so it's a very nice set of registers if you want to, to develop for RV32. <coughs> and so here are a few examples of a few instructions, and they are all divided in a few types. So there are six types, R, B, U, I, S, and J. Uh, 
the most important thing about these instructions is that they all place the <laughs> registers in the same position in the instruction. That means that you can, the, the hardware can read the registers before they can decode the instruction type, right? Uh, and you can have instructions that can fit up to three registers. And as we're talking about a 32-bit uh, architecture, uh, all the instructions are 32-bit long. Uh, some design choices of RIS-5 is a load store architecture, so every operation is register to register. Uh, it only has one address in mode, no trap for arith arithmetic overflow, no delayed branches and delayed loads. The late branches are uh, a uh, very interesting uh, concept. So in MIPS, if you have a branch, so let's say you have an if and you jump to another position, in MIPS, one or two instructions after you jump are executed. Right? So it, it's, a, it's a strange concept, but it, it can be useful in a few occasions. Uh, the program counter is not a register, it's just five. Uh, if you want to read it, the program counted, you can use these instructions, uh, this instruction. Uh, so it's at upper immediate to PC count with PC content. So we are reading, uh, we are storing the result of a constant plus the, the program counted and store it on a given register. And the good thing is because the program counter is not a register, uh, not and we don't have branch instructions. Uh, only the instructions that, that change the PC uh, can be used uh, done this, with this instruction. Uh, so one of the, the first, for, at least for me, one of the first confusions I had when I started to, to work with RISC-5 is that we don't have some instructions that are so common on x86. So how do we move the content of a register to another one. Uh, in, in x86, we have MOV, MOV, so you just move the content of one register to another. Uh, very high abstraction, but consider co moving the content of a variable to another one, assign a variable to another one. So anyone wants to take a guess on how we, we do this, this move, how we move the content of a register to another one? What? Yeah, you add zero. Yeah, great. <laughs> That's actually what we do. That's a great. So you you win a t-shirt because you you got it. So you you. No, I can not give it to you. Yeah, experience. So that's good. <laughs> so you get a t-shirt. Uh, okay, another question. How do we branch with equal to zero? Yeah, but. Yeah, no. yeah. That's yeah, uh, the the question was not very clear, but we don't have zero, right? We have register to register operations. So yeah, you get a t-shirt too. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, another question: How do you negate a register? How so we have a, co a value inside the register, and how do we negate it? Uh, no, you already. <laughs> as, uh, anyone want to take a guess? No. Excellent. Uh, we do a sub and zero, right? So that's and then we saw the content again on 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 the same content. That's how we negate it. Okay, last question: How do we jump without saving the return address? This is a bit more complex. Uh, yeah, I think you don't have enough information about that. But uh, you just store the return of the jump to zero. As I said previously, uh, we don't. If you write this to x zero, it's ignored. So you just uh, do the offset and jump, and you don't start the return, okay? Um, and, but we also have, and like in the assembly, we have some pseudo instructions, even though uh, the ISA doesn't have these instructions, uh, we can write them, and the assembly will generate the ones that we want. So we don't have MOV, but we have MEV, and the assembly will just generate this for us. Uh, we can, a branch equals zero and not using zero. Uh, we have nag to negate the, the, the variable. Yep. How do you make it floating point with the H of me? Oh, so the RV32i doesn't have floating points. We're going to talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so we have all the flavors of RIS5. We have 
RIS RV sixty four I, which introduces sixty four bit registers and sixty four bit uh, addressing modes, uh, and we have new instructions for words and double words. We have RV one hundred twenty eight I, uh, which today I'm. Um, I don't think we have any hardware for that. I think if you read the RISC-5 specification, it says that the top computers in the world today use 50 bits for, for addressing mode, and, but they project that by 2030, we're going to need more than 64 bits to address memory. So the XS scale supercomputers and so that's why they already um, have it on their specification. And we also have the RV32 and 64E, which, are, which stand for embedded. And as the specification says, I'm sorry, it's too small. Uh, we have 16 registers instead of 32. And the, if you have the, the encoding for the other registers, it's reserved for specific use. Um, Okay, so this is basic uh, RISC-5. We only have integers, we have load stores, all of those instructions that I mentioned. And the good thing about RISC-5 is that we can extend it, right? So let's say we want to multiply that in the divide. We don't have that in the basic specification. And so we have this extension that we call M that adds uh, divide and multiplication extensions. It had some new instructions. So it had mole, mole age, div and ram. So you get you multiply you multiply instruction uh, integers, you get division, you get a quotient and reminder. And the good thing is that the core, the, the specification can choose to implement that. So that's the, the beauty of RISC-V. You can choose to extend your core, your design to support these instructions. And if you do, now you don't call it RV32I anymore. It's called RV32IM, so because of the new extension. Let's say you want to use floating points. So there's an uh, extension for that as well. Uh, it adds new floating point. Oops, what happened? Uh, we have new floating point registers and floating point instructions. And it's, then, it's an app extension. Yeah, it's float add, sub, mu, yeah, it's fuse multiply add, you add square root. Um, and now we have RV32I MF if you support float single precision floating point. Well, let's say you want to support double, doubles, right? And we have an extension for that, which is called D. And now your core is called MFD. Uh, Let's say you want to support the comics. You have the A extension, MFDA. Let's say you have a control start status register like ARM. So you have MFDA, ZICSR. And let's say you have fences, right? So now you have MFDA, ZICSR, ZI fence high. And as you imagine, this gets big. And eventually, we shorten this, all of this to G. <laughs> uh, so if you see this on a, in the wild, RV32G, RV64G, that means that we support all of these extensions. This is usually uh, the basic, uh, the more common you, way you use in the wild. Uh, OK, uh, so let's see you want to compress instructions. What are compress, compress instructions? So remember that I told you that all the shocks are 32 bit long, uh, but we want to compress them and uh, you know to make it cheaper to to produce the, the chip. So every instruction there is an extension for that C uh, that expands compressing compressed instructions to uncompress uncompress the ones and think of it like arm thumb you can compress the instructions and make it smaller. And the great thing about it is that the compiler doesn't care about it. You just generate the instruction, and the assembler looks at your code and compresses it for you. And if you support it, now you have GC. So RV32, IGC. 
And we have more extensions, right? RV is about extensions. So let's say you have no standard extension. So think about it, think of it like uh, vendors specific extensions. You can add an X. You want to do bit manipulation, you have extensions for that. Vectors, extensions for that. Half precision floating points, why not? You already have extensions defined for that. B float 16, which is usually used for AI. More extensions. Cryptography, also extensions. And if you want instructions that don't uh, that, that change behavior, specify behavior, we also get that. And you can imagine where this is going, right? A few moments later. You get this. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read it, OK? Uh, but this is a very common way of. Uh, what the size of the IEC is this? <laughs> <laughs> USB. Uh, so this is a common extension, actually, a, a, a common ISA. And we are not going to keep writing all of this, right? And how we deal with the fragmentation. Right? Uh, this is common, but let's say a vendor doesn't want to implement all of this, just part of it. Uh, so we have profiles. Uh, so this was a. It come up from from the RV International, and it's a way to provide this portability be between uh, prof between all the extensions. So now we have profiles that are defined by year. So we have RVA 20U64, 22, 23. They are defined by the year they were <laughs> created. The profile and by the year and. Think of it like the microarchitectures uh, on x86, so we have v3, v4, etc. And now the big <laughs> string of ours just become our VA 23 u 64 right? So we don't have to keep uh, writing that all the time. Um, so wrapping up uh, this this talk, a recap about this five. It's a free and open ISA. Very simple, but with tons of extensions. And because of that, we have profiles. Uh, and if you want to know more, I suggest, I'm going to give you some suggestions. So this is a very nice uh, extension for RIS-5 privilege ISAs. So think of it as instructions can that can be used by your hypervisor, but cannot be used by in user space, can be used by your OS, your kernel, but not in user space. It's a very nice extension, and it's very detailed, and it's very nice to read and learn a little bit more about RIS-5. If you want to buy a book, this is RIS-5 Reader, and a very nice book about RIS-5. I didn't read it at all, but it, it has a lot of information. It's really nice. Uh, if you want to try a simulator. There's a tool called Spike that you can use to run your, your user space programs. You can also use QMU uh, to, to, to work. Actually, I use it daily when I'm developing QMU. You can also try to build your own core on Chisel. So Chisel, it's a, a scalar tool, scalar, uh, and you can design your own uh, core there. It's, uh, it's very simple. So as you can see, uh, RV32 has uh, not, not enough, not a lot of instructions. So it should, it should be very simple to implement that. If you want to work on a bug, right now RV32G is limited in the Linux kernel to, all, to address only one gig of RAM. So I have friends at Igalia that have been constantly nagged to fix this for me, <laughs> but they are ignoring me. So if you want to try to understand more about the architecture and learn more about the kernel, I think this is the great way to start. Uh, and finally, what are we doing in Igalia uh, related to RIS-5? So we have, I have two colleagues working on different things. Uh, so Bolt, Bolt is a tool that started in, in Facebook uh, before it was Meta, and is 
it's an optimizer for binaries. Uh, it's similar to profile guided uh, optimization, but it works on the binary, so it's a very nice tool. And it's been ported to Bolt. And if you want to read more about it, uh, I don't expect you to remember this, but just write porting Bolt Twist 5 on Google. You're going to find this blog post. It's very detailed, it's very nice. We have Luke, so that was by Yob. Uh, we have Luke working on supporting vectors on LLVM. Uh, these are PRs uh, on the LLVM uh, way of identifying them. Uh, so he's been working for, I think, one year already to support vectors. And I am, as I said early, earlier, I'm working on LibC the LLVM libc, which is a very nice piece of software that is written in C++. So we have a libc that is written in C++, and RV64G was completed last May, and I am working on 32G right now. Uh, one of the requirements yeah. to have it uh, fully supported in the LLVM is to have build bots, and we have build bots that should be up soon um, they are using QEMU because we don't have hardware, uh, RV32G hardware, so we are emulating all the system. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Yep. I mean, one, one of the issues of having those extensions guaranteeing that software developed generically run yep. all boards and how is risk five guaranteeing this is happening with so many different yeah so the thing is the risk five doesn't guarantee it uh, yeah i'm saying risk five so the the so vendor has to give you the profile and but yeah that's a good question there's a thing called uh, feature detection on the hardware so you can check uh, in runtime what's supported, and you can have your code with instructions that are supported, and you just jump for them when you need it. Let's say you 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 have a piece of code that does vector operations and another piece of code that doesn't do them, and you when you start the program you read the the, the features of the of the, the processor, and then you jump to the piece of code that is supported. Yeah, so it will increase the size of the binary, but... but what yeah. about more fundamental features like float points? Yeah, so as I saw in the wild, everyone supports the G extension. Okay. So you're guaranteed to at least have uh, floating points, doubles, integers, and whatnot. Atomics, fences. Um, profiles are very new thing, uh, and I think it's the first time I saw a profile in the wild. It's Luajit. I don't know if you heard of Luajit. It's used on NeoVim, for instance, and they define that your hardware needs to be complied with uh, the RVA 32, uh, 22. Uh, so you also have software that defines the minimal requirements, otherwise they will not run. Just to answer the question from Alaska, there is a task group called Unified Scope. They are writing how the extension or instruction is updated by when you start using a given chip. So there, it's a mess, but they're going to find that. Yeah. And that, start, that, 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 that task group started two years ago, two years ago, and died. And they are returning right now with a new chair and vice chair. So they're going to find that by the end of the year. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so for instance, I was working, before I was I started to work on Lipsy, I was working with WebKit, and we do JIT like there. And so we just basically support RV32G. Even if your hardware does, I don't know, vector cryptography and stuff, we just don't generate instruction for it. Yeah, but then you lose performance. Yeah, at least you don't crash, right? Yeah. Yeah? Yes, so, um... My question is if you have an idea, you can give us an idea of uh, which boards are out there, uh, what are industry using? Yeah, so you can get one of the Sci-Fi 2, uh, 
I think is around a hundred dollars. Um, I bought mine like six months ago. It's a Chinese website, Yonggi Jung, Yonggi Jung. Uh, yeah. Old Mac. Uh, a website called Old Mac in China. They sell all kind of. Okay. Kind of yeah, you. Uh, this one I bought is like a hundred dollars, and it's it, it's not as cheap as a Raspberry Pi, but uh, you can find them. Uh, we had more of like we had these Starfire producing those kind of boards. We had Sci-Fi doing more boards. Oh, yeah. Sci-Fi is with. Oh, art. mine is. Oh, this is Starfire. Oh, mine is uh, Sci-Fi. 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 They sold out all their boards when they launched. We had in sale working with Sci-Fi to produce a more capable board. That's uh, the discussion was when they're going to launch. That's going to be called more Street. We had a uh, startup from China called New New Five. They have, uh, say, the best desktop right now. It's a use five being the desktop that allows you to up to 128 gigabytes of memory. It has a 10 gigabytes. I think they are producing a tablet now, right? Yeah, we have tablets. Yeah. We have a laptop. Laptops are expensive right now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's using a, a, a use five core made by Alibaba, or the key hack that the lab in Alibaba that you see. It costs five k dollars yeah. right now, so we don't have a lot. Yeah. Uh, and the majority of the companies we have which is five that the six are producing IPs. So all this can be You can buy chips from Alibaba today and from others, uh, but not that much yet. Now you can buy device like uh Esperanto AI from is a Europe based company. They provide they created a kind of PCI card with one one thousand uh five cores that you can buy, put in a, any kind of board and start to all the NVIDIA CPUs contain our RISC V cores, so we can play that if you will. A lot of your uh, wired device that you use with your system uses are using RISC V. So, usually, the, the easiest way to get started is buying this kind of board. We also have a friend developing a yeah. RISC V <laughs> yeah. R32. We have, yeah. The easiest way is using those kind of boards. Or that are you can build kernel. I do build kernel on those kind of boards, so you can can do anything you want. You can even for that specific board, you can install Debian, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, the latest Ubuntu, 23 or and Fedora, I believe. Yeah. So it's all running. Arc as well. Yeah. So you can. Yeah, you can. A lot of it, there. Yeah, the one I have at home, I I do all my testing and in, in the hardware, no. The 32 bit because I don't have it, but the 64 one, uh, I just build LLVM, you know, Ubuntu image in, in the board and just run. It's not very fast, but it's the actual thing running, so you get better results. Like servers coming soon. We now have those kind of companies that integrate hardware looking for this file. So at some point, and by the end of the year, we're going to have more more powerful servers available. The one next today is the availability of chips. So we have the company producing, but there's no guarantee that they can provide a, a huge amount of chips yet for those companies. <coughs> Things are growing. Brazil is producing one. Uh, Brazil. There's a group of five universities in Brazil working on design to find a new chip for the five. Things are working on that. So, uh, so, so Rafael is from the Luis Five International. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And if you're a student looking for an internship, just Ask him. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. We have a lot of programs. We yeah. have programs with the Respect Foundation that we pay students for three months. Six thousand, six k US dollars for three months. So we basically work with me on a lot of different projects that we have. We have a that project. All right. Any other questions? Speaking of internships, um, is there any reference uh, online about the uh, memory, the Asian uh, Linux memory limitation? No, really. I it's just I actually sent a bunch of emails to several Middle East. Everyone ignored me. Uh, but, but I don't think anyone is working on it right now. But no, I mean, yeah. I, I guess I'm asking for those ref references, like the threads that the students could. Oh yeah, but students are right. So, to solve that issue, so the first step it would be to build a 32 bit image. You can use Yokoto for that, and as a Base resource and you can. Yokoto is a tool to generate images for embedded software. You generate Linux images with all the 
usual Linux environment, and you can load in in QMU. Includes the kernel and everything. Uh, I don't think there is any discussion right now public about it. I've sent a few emails, but I think I'll, I only got reply from the Yokodo team because I thought it was a problem on their side of building the image, but it's a kernel, a kernel limitation right now. Yeah. So what is the state of what upstream for this part and the force? And and what? Like Linux kernel. So Linux kernel, I think, six point one or six point six point one loads and runs just fine. So that's the latest LTS on Ubuntu. Uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't read all the sensors. So my board has sensors for temperature and stuff that uh, you cannot read with six point one. But I think on six point point four or like sci five at least for my board. You can get everything you need. Yeah, uh, continue uh, the subject. Yeah. Uh, how about the peripherals, uh, like GPU, uh, I don't know, cameras and other uh, things? Are they uh, the ones uh, that are already uh, used by other boards, or do we need a special driver? Are they support? Are, are they no, not really. Support? If you if you have a Linux kernel, it should just plug and play. It should work. The my board has a. HDMI, but the HDMI doesn't work yet. Uh, so you have no video output. You have terminal, but you don't have video output. Uh, there is a closed source drive for that, uh, but I don't think there is an open source uh, drive for it. All right. So I think right now HDMI is the only thing not working properly. But uh, like from what I. Um, talk to you yesterday. Uh, if it's an imagination GPU, they are starting to upstream the imagination driver. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, One thing that interesting is that two or three months ago, we launched a Weeping Linux edition, a new project called Rise. It's by Paul Ferguson. It is hosted under Linux Foundation for Europe. Which means that I mean, that, that specific new project is going to cost all the cost for this file. So we have companies like Red Hat, which are maybe a free game or Intel, and others doing just software. We, we have this file international, are going to keep maintaining the ISA and do all the harder stuff. And the Rise pro project is going to cover the software ecosystem, which means that Oracle or the database or other companies that are willing to get their software run on this file or optimize this file can join RISE and work by either paying someone or allocate engineer, engineers to work uh, to do the job. So that's growing fast. We have a lot of things going on on, the, on, on RISE. We, we started two months ago and a lot of they, they even completed the support for Kubernetes in one month. So things are moving way faster than we thought. So RISE is a good way to stay in touch or get uh, the up-to-date information about software and the system on, on about this project. Uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to know more about bottlenecks on embedded systems. Uh, about what? Uh, on embedded system devices. Uh, how is, uh, is there any profiling about uh, 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 that energetic, energetic efficiency about, about or even of some comparisons with the uh, actual processors on embed embedded devices? Not that I'm aware of. So profiles are most, mostly related to extensions, so it's not a specific, I don't have a profile for power, for instance, uh, so uh, they are defined about uh, the general set of uh, extensions. That depends on the yeah. extensions. It, the, what's defined by the, the committee in that year. Right. And just another question, uh, I'd like to know if there are any open projects that we can put to good uh, by, uh, or even learning by. So uh, the LibCM Lib, uh, Libc is a very nice, uh, project if you want to learn about this file. Uh, there is very little assembly there. It's written in C++, but you can you can you can learn about the structure and how we, we do for instance startup, how do you do CRT zero uh, on on a program. So you can just look at the code there and check how we do for this five. How we set the registers, the global pointers, thread pointers, and everything. I think it's a great project if you want to learn a little bit on how the things 
uh, are done in runtime and how things are working. Um, for more low level stuff, I would just say go look at the kernel and how the, the specific parts of the kernel uh, are implemented for this file. Yep. Does Swiss file information provide any standardization on the boot process or it's like. On the what? Boot process? Yeah. yeah. There's a, a test group called BRTS yeah. that started, we started one month ago. They're going to find everything regarding the boot. So, I mean, that's really easy. It's a really, um, there's a really list of people about to make a list of people who we decided to make that an external one. And right now, people are sharing a lot of ideas about how to make that happen, including implementation. So it's happening right now. If you want to yeah. see what's going on, that's why they made a list. Okay, any other questions? All right, we're done. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be back in 15 minutes, more or less, for the next talk. Okay? Thank you.